Hello, it's 6.30 on uh, the 12th of June, 2023, and I'm calling to order this meeting of the Planning and Development Council of the Town of Oakville. Madam Clerk, we are all present. There are no regrets. And uh, uh, the, uh, the next matter we need to cover off is we have a declaration of pecuniary interest by Councillor Adams, and I'll ask if any others wish to make a declaration while I turn to Councillor Adams to make his announcement. Thanks very much. I want to declare an interest in item 6.2 as I have a family member who is employed at an adjacent site. Thank you, Councillor. Would uh, two of us like to move and second in us into committee of the whole? Councillor Chenna, Councillor has the deal. Thank you. Any objection? There being none, we are resolved into a committee of the whole, which is a relaxed set of rules that we use traditionally for planning matters. Uh, Council, you have um, two consent items in front of you and staff are available if you have questions. I'm looking for a motion or a question. Councilor Knoll. Councilor Knoll is moving the consent items. We don't, use a we don't need a seconder in the committee of the whole. I'm explaining as we go for the audience who's uh, perhaps unfamiliar with our, our uh, different rules. Um, I'll ask if there's an objection to Councillor Knoll's motion. Seeing none, the consent items are consented to. And that brings us to the first of our two public hearing items. The first one is the public meeting report for the official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment applications concerning Amica Brawny Village, Inc. We have a presentation from Colin Chung of Glenn Schnarr and Associates. And uh, our staff rep on this is our planner, Colin Westerhoff. We have a couple of registered delegations and we will poll the audience for any further delegations at the appropriate time. At this time, I invite everyone to give your attention to Mr. Chung. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, for the record, my name is Colin Chung, planner with Glen Starn Associates. Um, before I get into my presentation, I'll maybe share my personal story. 37 years ago, I started my planning career. My first job was with the town of Oakville planning department. So. After 37 years, in the eve of my career, it's so nice to come back it, before you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm here before you on behalf of the uh, proponent, the owner, uh, Amica, who's proposing to develop the subject site for seniors' residents. Next page, please. The subject site is on the south side of Lakeshore Road West, just between Jones Street and Nelson Street. It's about uh, 0.9 acres in size, and it's got a, a frontage on Lakeshore Road West as 210 feet frontage. Next slide, please. Just uh, this slide shows relative uh, terms what is currently approved versus what is being proposed. Um, to the right of the slide is the proposed and latest still working drawing of the rendering of the project. Um, the application before you, Mr. Mayor, is an official plan amendment and rezoning application to increase the approved height from four stories to six stories. Um, as a result, the zoning bylaw is also being proposed to be amended, which currently permits maximum of four stories to the maximum of six stories. Um, as a result of that, there are no other zoning standards being proposed to be changed other than those. Um, just for information's sake, the current height is 15 meters permitted. The six story would um, accommodate 22.6 meters, so zoning bylaw is being proposed with a height change to 27 meters. Um, with additional two stories in height, there's additional residential units and these are really care units from the four story that's approved. So there's two floors of additional care units being proposed. And the care units increase uh, from 113 total units, which also has independent living seniors, uh, to additional uh, 46 units to the total of 159 units. That results in increase in GFA, as you can see. Uh, parking spaces are being increased as well to accommodate the additional units. The landscape area is, stays the same. Um, we're proposing to maintain the same landscaping area component and also the bike, bike parking areas. Next slide, please. These next few slides 
Mr. Mayor, is also contained in the staff information report. These are factual information on the current land use designation of the subject site. It is within the Bronte Village land use mixed uh, Main Street 1, which permits seniors housing mixed use development, up to four stories. Next slide, please. The current zoning is mixed use Main Street. Um, it permits, again, mixed use permission, seniors housing, up to four stories. So the proposal is to increase the zoning bylaw to six stories. Next slide, please. Uh, the slide, the image to the, to the left on this slide is to show a perspective of the 45 degree angular plane from Lakeshore Road West to the proposed project. Um, it's, a, it's a bit of a conceptual illustration to show that the, the streetscape, the massing, uh, adheres to the town's standards for 45 degree urban design angular plane. Uh, in terms of the height being proposed. Um, the proponent had two informal resident meetings back in March 2023. They invited and an, an approximately 40 uh, residents attended, including town staff and some of the councillors. Uh, there were some really good discussions and questions that arose from the residents, and we tried to capture some of them in summary. Uh, building height, which relates to shadowing and privacy was a concern raised by the residents. Uh, parking, um, traffic, um, the role of this project in terms of economic development and viability of the community was a, a, a issue raised by the residents. Affordability, given the type of seniors housing being proposed. And is this use and the height increase appropriate for the use in the area? Uh, those are really good questions that, that we've took notes and we'll certainly be re responding to them as part of the planning process. The residents also acknowledged with respect to this proposal, the design of the building. I think there's some sense that, you know, we're the proponents working towards a design that is appeasing. Um, housing shortage for seniors. So this has some value to that um, and more seniors care in the community. Next slide, please. Mr. Mayor, this is just the factual stuff uh, with respect to the applications. I'm not gonna go through it in all of these textual bullet form, but it's in the staff information report as well. And it really captures some of the slide presentation I made uh, previously. It's just a summary of where we are with the application. Uh, currently, the application is being processed, reviewed, circulated to the agencies for comment. The technical reports that were submitted along with the applications are being reviewed. Uh, we haven't received the comprehensive circulation comments yet. Uh, our intent is once we get those comments, we'll incorporate them with the residents' discussions and the notes that we took from the two informal meetings. And we wanna ensure that we address the comments from the residents, from this, the town departments and agencies in a comprehensive manner. Next slide, please. On that note, Mr. Mayor, I conclude my presentation. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much for the presentation. And um, what, we're, what we customarily do with this kind of report for the benefit of the public, this is not a decision meeting. This is a meeting we convene for the specific purpose of identifying the issues that planning staff should consider when they decide what to recommend to council. And so um, customarily, Council will hear from the uh, public and Mr. Chung. Uh, in a moment, I'll ask Council if they have any special questions of you, but normally we would uh, reserve those for your later appearance. Uh, the, the idea is to get the issues on the list that the planning director will keep uh, during the meeting. And uh, I'm speaking now to those who would delegate. Uh, the more you know, the greater degree to which you can say, my issue is this, the, the easier it will be for the planning director to write down your issue and, and deal with it later. But you're free to say anything you want. Uh, I'm just trying to tell you how to be more helpful uh, for the staff. Council, do you have any questions for Mr. Chong? 
Thank you, sir, for your information. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Madam Clerk, would you call the registered delegations? The first delegation is Robert Mark. Mr. Mark, welcome. Council looks forward to your information. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and councillors for allowing me the opportunity to express my views. Um, I'm not uh, representing a delegation, uh, but I'll say a little bit about that. Um, my name is Robert Mark. My wife and I have been Oakville residents for over 45 years. We are current condominium owners and residents uh, of Ennis Clare on the Lake at 2170 and 2180 Marine Drive. Uh, 2170 and 2180 Marine Drive are two high-rise condominium towers consisting of over 300 condominium units with somewhere between five and 600 residents. Although I am here this evening to express my personal views on the proposed Amica development, I know they are shared by a great number of Ennis Clare residents. I'm supportive of the proposed Amica development for reasons including the following. Going from four to six floors would provide much needed additional housing for seniors with special needs. The proposed six floor development provides for different levels of housing and care, including a dedicated floor for residents with dementia and Alzheimer's. There is Lakeshore Street level provision for commercial space. Oakville's population and especially Brontes are aging rapidly and there is already an acute shortage of dedicated health care professionals for seniors, including doctors, registered nurses and experts certified in dementia care. And I believe an Amica facility will bring in additional staff to fill some of this unmet need. The proposed Amica development could help seniors with different needs age together within their community. The walkability of the location is excellent for seniors. The housing market might experience a refresh as seniors re relocate from within the community to Amica. I appreciate from experience that town development can be very challenging and disruptive for residents and for town officials. The town's elected officials need to be mindful and sensitive to the concerns of the local residents who may be negatively affected by development, but also to the needs of the community as a whole. Uh, it is also important to understand that towns and municipalities, as I understand it, have to act within the mandates dictated to them by the province. From personal experience, I can appreciate and understand the concerns of the residents of the surrounding 40 or so townhouses to the proposed Amica development that may be negatively impacted to varying degrees by concerns including those of shadowing, sunlight and privacy and perhaps others. Having said that, I'm in favor of permitting the proposed Amica development to proceed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mark. Uh, before you run away, are there members of council with questions for the gentleman? Thank you very much for your You're information. Thank you. Madam Clerk, the next delegation, please. The next delegation is Harry Shea from the Bronte Village Residents Association. Welcome, Mr. Shea. Council looks forward to your information. Good evening, Mayor Burton and members of Town Council. Uh, as stated, my name is Harry Shea and I'm with the Bronte Village Residents Association. The BVRA was not able to attend either one of the two in-person public information meetings held on the same day of March 21st due to various scheduling uh, conflicts. However, the BVRA has had two meetings with Amica's senior staff and one meeting with Amica's architect. We discussed our three concerns during these meetings. First, in our initial meeting with Amica senior staff and again with their architect, we highlighted that our retail in Bronte Village has been shrinking significantly as new developments have wiped out our existing retail space and regardless of how much new retail space is planned with these new developments, it does not replace all the retail stock that has been lost. 
We are very pleased that Amica has acknowledged the community's need for more retail at grade and has decided to have a portion of the retail space now facing forward for public access from the sidewalk. We would have preferred to have it all, but we recognize their need to service their residents. Furthermore, we discussed with Amica that ideally we would want this space to afford, to afford a vibrant retail experience. Vibrant retail in which a restaurant could be located and with design options like possibly a Juliet balcony or floor to ceiling windows, which could be open onto the sidewalk. It is our understanding that their revised plans will attempt to include these features and we're very supportive of this. Second, the BVRA has heard from the community who live to the east of the proposed development regarding their shadowing concerns. We address shadow concerns with Amica. Amica indicated they would look at how they might be able to scale back the envelope to minimize the effects of shadowing. I personally understand these shadowing concerns because I too have, have concerns with the new development being built next to me, next to where I live. Once the building is completed, I too will live in the shadows. How will it affect me in terms of the total loss of sunlight, time will only tell. But the uncertainty of not knowing is real and Amica's efforts to help reduce the shadow's impact is greatly appreciated. The property on the other side of Amica's site will in time be redeveloped as well. The location is currently zoned RH. It is conceivable that in the future, Amica too will be in someone else's shadow. Third, we address parking with Amica. We asked Amica to consider off-street parking in front of their building as the site is being built out now. Waiting for the Lakeshore Road reconstruction, which, which is at a minimum five years away and more like seven to 10 years until that reconstruction is completed to have off-street parking is not an option. We need the extra parking now. And Amica's willingness to consider off-street parking should not only be approved, but more importantly, welcomed. We also asked Amica about consideration of a public-private partnership for additional parking underground or at very least to have underground parking which could be allocated for public access. I am told by staff that current public underground parking in Bronte goes underutilized because people do not want to park underground. I'd like to offer an alternate theory. Underground parking in Bronte goes underutilized because of poor or non-existing signage letting the public know where the public parking is. Having public parking available and not telling the public where it is, is like, well, winking in the dark. No one knows you're doing it except yourself. I believe tonight it would be more than appropriate to share that the BVRA has stood before the Planning and Development Council from this very podium or its predecessor with previous applications in which we had an adversarial role between the developer and the community. Emica, on the other hand, has been different. They've shown a real desire to work with the community. Examples of this community engagement is their willingness to customize their hoarding with images supplied by the Bronte Historical Society. As an aside, the BVRA has an agreement in principle with another developer to use the same graphics for their hoarding to have a unified look or feel along Lakeshore as we endure the wave of interruptions with the upcoming construction. Now back to Amica. We asked Amica during one of our meetings about their willingness to offer their open space before construction for potential public use for pop-up pop events, like music, maybe an occasional food truck. We even asked about the possibility of parking, which we realized was a stretch. Amica has indicated their willingness to prepare a portion of this open space for this public use. Details on their end are being worked out. The BVRA acknowledges this public benefit would be limited in time, but while available and utilized could add a fun buzz to the village. The BVRA asked council to direct town staff to provide the necessary support to Amica to see this possibility come to fruition. Amica's outreach to the community candidly has been refreshing. It should be used as a community engagement model with future development applications that surely will come. My closing comment is directed toward town staff as much as it is with town council. It is the discussion of vibrant retail, which I brought up as our first concern. I implore council to use all the means available to ensure that utility lockers at grade do not impede the vibrant retail concept. 
It is my understanding that Enbridge in the past has been less than flexible regarding the placement of utility lockers. If the town through town, if the, if the town through staff recommendations is going to continue to promote an urban feel to all future mixed development, to all future mixed developments, an urban feel that Bronte Village can benefit from, then town council must direct and support staff's concerted effort to ensure this urban vibe is, is delivered. Lastly, notwithstanding the concerns mentioned previously, the BVRA supports the official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment submitted by Emma Cabranti Village, Inc. I thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Shea, for your information. Council, are there questions for the gentleman? Thank you very much, sir. I promised I would poll the audience. Are there other members of the public with information for council to consider, i.e., are there other issues to be added to the list that the planning director is keeping? Going once, going twice. All right, I'll confine it to table and I'll look for um, the councillors. Councillor McNeese, you're, you're moving the, the uh, indicated motion. You have a question, then you have the floor. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, really just want to sort of emphasize the contribution to the list of issues that um, were raised, uh, as well as at the two public information meetings back on uh, March 21st, um, which both councillors uh, attended as well. Um, one question I do have, though, and it, it could go to the applicant. Uh, I don't see the number here as far as what is the allocation of commercial visitor parking that is underground? I see that the number of parking spaces um, is. Actually, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to you to, to sort of uh, fill us in on that. Mr. Chung? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, the councillor. It's uh, 12 parking spaces dedicated to commercial uh, space and usage. Okay, and just for clarity, so is that uh, split between visitors to the residential side uh, and visitors to the commercial side? It's uh, 12 spaces, visitors to the commercial side only. Commercial side only, and is that uh, in intended for staff of the commercial space or for patrons, say you have pa a restaurant? Patrons. Okay, so, so one request we have is what we found, and I believe Mr. Shea mentioned in his delegation, is that these aren't well advertised or promoted. They're oftentimes behind a, a closed door that has a key code or, or something like that. But um, I'll, I'll put it over to staff if they can come with some recommendations and potentially work with you to figure out um, how can we get sort of cars in the right places. It works for everyone, works for you guys, for your businesses, and works for, for us when we have some, uh, some parking challenges there. Uh, so that's one, and I'll add it to the staff list. Um, uh, as well, I notice on the street front there, um, I, I believe there's a proposed utility locker for uh, Enbridge uh, gas that's sort of on our street front. So again, we'll add that to our list to try to collaborate on how could we get that off our street front. I also noticed in one of your renderings, uh, it looks like a garage door in the for this west side for um, you know, if we could look into minimizing the number of curb cuts, that would add a second curb cut, and we're trying to build a continuous, you know, Lakeshore Road that's pedestrian friendly. Every curb cut sort of uh, hinders that. But if there's any way of accessing that internally through your one uh, driveway, that that would be ideal. So I'll add that to the, the staff list uh, as well. Um, additionally. Have you contemplated in your designs that there will likely be developments to the west of your building at, at some point? Uh, currently, it's a low-rise restaurant. It's zoned for more. I noticed in the rendering that um, you have some windows, and it looks like there's a slight setback. Um, you know, and, and certainly the neighbors to your east have concerns about that. But you know, you you in addition may have concerns when there's an application to your west. Um, is, is that, uh, you know, do you have, do you feel that you have mitigating factors, uh, for that? Uh, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor, I certainly defer to the experts on the team about the architectural design and the building design, but that's something that the proponent will have to take into consideration, that this is not a static development along Lakeshore Road West. It's a very vibrant community, and one of the things that, from a design perspective, that the architect will have to look at is the, the I call it the cumulative 
uh, implications of other developments that are proceeding on Lakeshore Road West. So that's, that's a very good comment, thank you. Okay, and I'll, I'll uh, add that to staff's list as well, uh, and on both sides, so we don't have a delegate uh, here today from the mixed use uh, units to the east. However, on the March 21st, uh, two PICs, um, you know, we heard loud and clear that they have some concerns. Um, and I know in our official plan, it's not well contemplated. How do you transition on the side to something like a work live unit? But uh, if staff has any recommendations or if they can work with you on, on continuing to work with those, those uh, homeowners there uh, uh, to address their concerns. Um, I believe that one of the delegates mentioned uh, lay-by parking in front. I, I would certainly advocate for that. I believe once Lakeshore Road's reconstructed, we'll be looking to add more parking and why wait for that project when we could be adding it now. I was uh, just in Barrie that had flexible bollards where, you know, one day it could be a patio, the next day it's parking, and this could be a good site to pilot it. So I'll add that to staff's list uh, as well. Uh, and uh, I think that's it on my list. So, uh, yeah, that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Are there other councillors with uh, items to add to staff's list? Councillor O'Meara. Uh, thank you, Worship. You, you can have a seat there, sir. That's why I'm just mostly for staff here. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, a quick question for staff. Again, in the report, I didn't see a breakdown of percentage of commercial area on the ground floor. Can you tell me what that is? It wasn't in the rep as much as I could see. Sorry, unless it's buried somewhere. Uh, thank you for the question, through uh, Mayor. Um, that would actually be a, a excellent question for the delegate here this evening. We we'll have a better understanding of the retail and commercial breakdown on that ground floor. Thanks. Okay, well, so maybe while you're there then, and I can ask the delegate in a second, um, what is our allowance for amenity space on ground floor for retail still? What's our, what, what's our allowance? Uh, through you, Mayor, I, I would have to get back to you on that. I don't have that uh, regulation in front of me right now. Okay, uh, we can add that to the list. Yep. Um, uh, well, well, I've got you here then. Just another question before I add to the list here. Um, with all the recent changes in provincial legislation, um, what effect can we have on an urban design or on an urban look and feel of a building? Uh, yeah, through Mr. Mayor, uh, the Town of Oakville has an urban design guidelines and we are able to implement those design guidelines through the site plan approval process. So whenever, um, you know, if we move past the stage to a subsequent site plan approval process, we have that opportunity to comment on those urban design um, considerations, and we've heard a couple of them today from uh, Councillor McNeese and, and members of the public. So those will, those are on my list, and, and those will be implemented for sure. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you very much for that. Um, and I'm really sorry, Your Worship. Maybe if I can just ask the delegate the question, or the uh, proponent the question of the... I believe percentage. Mr. Chung is eager to answer any question you've got. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> I'll try my best, Mr. Mayor. And, and sorry, yeah, so the question was just what is the percentage of retail, um, publicly retail commercial space on the ground floor as opposed to the entirety of the ground floor? Yeah, um, to you, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor. Um, rather than speaking about percentage, because as a layman, it's hard to understand percentages, but the total space is 467 square meters, approximately 4,670 square feet of retail space on the main floor. And how much is that is specifically for Amica alone on the main floor? That is for a, a public uh, use retail space, not for Amica only. So it's a space that would be for the, the community. Okay, I feel like we're, we're sort of doing a waltz around the floor yeah. here. So is there any space on the ground floor that will only be for Amica residents? I believe there will be. <laughs> so can you tell me what that is then? Um, just sure. Uh, we don't have, Mr. Mayor, that, uh, I guess, uh, square footage broken down. So that will be one of the information we will share with staff for you. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. I have a couple of remaining points for our staff. Thank you. 
Um, so staff, one of my items that I would like to add is what, are, what is the percentage of, of publicly accessible retail on the main floor? How much is solely dedicated to Amica residents? And is that in keeping with the revitalization of our main street area? Um, I would also like along the lines of that, from the pictures I've seen, I'm seeing, the look and feel on Main Street area is that of residential, even though it may be commercial, it doesn't look like that. It looks like a continuous flow of residential. So what can we do to make a visible urban delineation between residential up top and commercial down below? Um, and then lastly, I would just like to... Um, um, well, let's just leave it with that. I, I, I do have a question as well. I, I, sorry, one last thing. When, when at the four store, we went from 113 units and 51 parking spots, which is roughly a 45% uh, parking spot to unit uh, um, uh, uh, percentage. Uh, by adding two spots, we've moved down to 40%. So I'm wondering why in addition of two stories, we've clawed back 5% of parking to retail. So if we can take a look at, at how those uh, transitions went, I would be appreciated. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. We now have questions from uh, Councillor Chisholm. Well, thank you, Your Worship. Just a, more of a comment than a question with respect to um, um, all the new developments that are happening in uh, Main Street. Uh, it seems to, you know, working with the BIAs, it's concerns is that we're losing commercial space, um, uh, decreasing commercial space. Yes, they're putting commercial space in, but it's less than it was uh, there previously. So. Um, I don't know if, if uh, staff can consider looking at commercial space. And I think it runs lines of uh, Council of Mayor's uh, questions too. So I won't repeat myself, but I think that the commercial uh, co uh, component of uh, developments need to be seriously looked at uh, in the future and hopefully some kind of development policy or whatever we can do to ensure that the, uh, the commercial space is viable. Um, I get really concerned we're doing all these residential developments and we're losing commercial. Uh, the, second, the second part uh, question um, of staff, the reality of underground parking is becoming um, uh, an ongoing uh, concern with residents and so forth because of security and, and safety and so forth. Uh, but the point was well taken. If we're going to underground parking, do we have a, um, a municipal uh, procedural um, uh, uh, policies with respect to how uh, we access uh, public parking underground and where they're located and uh, those type of questions because I think we're the best kept secret in Oakville with respect to underground parking that has public access. Um, and I think that needs to be uh, uh, being, you know, we have our parking garage, but I think underground parking and partnerships with, with the private sector uh, needs to be uh, identified and so well, I guess the question is, can staff please look at the underground parking uh, process and into the future of what we can do to, to uh, communicate and um, access a better result for the community? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Chisholm. Councillor Hazlitt Thiel, your turn. Thank you, Mayor Burton. Um, most of my questions got asked by Sean and Jonathan, who did a great job. Um, I do have just two follow-ups. One is, uh, I note that there is a uh, dementia wing and, and um, as a care facility, I'm just wondering about what the best practice is around the parking ratio. Um, if you could just report back on that. Um, uh, in, in our ward, we have a, a facility where the parking is not sufficient for, for the folks who visit their, uh, their loved ones. So I just wondered what the best practice was. And um, my only other comment is, I just wanted to thank uh, the proponent because this is one of the best documented public information meeting minutes I've seen. And um, I appreciated the level of detail that you shared. So thank you for that. Thank you, Councillor Hazlitt Thiel. All right, planners, can you uh, uh, <coughs> detail the list that you have caught as it went by? And then we'll look for someone who wants to move the package. Uh, thank you, Mayor. So I'll, I'll run this down from the top. So we'll start with shadowing and, and sunlight concerns, retail and commercial needs, and I'll expand on that in a bit, urban design and streetscape requirements, parking availability, specifically commercial and retail parking, uh, both on street and on site, as well as underground, uh, curb cuts and access to the site, 
implications of adjacent future developments along Lakeshore Road West, um, ground floor amenity area regulation versus um, what's, what's available for strictly Amica residents and, and what's available for the public. Um, so we'll have that breakdown. Um, you know, the, the fact that it's keeping with this main street area character, urban design delineations between this residential and, and commercial uh, aspect along the corridor and uh, height change um, in terms of uh, their effect on parking regulations for commercial areas. Um, and then we have um, some topics regarding, you know, policies and best practices for underground parking and, and public access to those. Um, and then best practices for parking ratios uh, amongst the types of care in the facility. Thank you. Councillor McNeese, is that you moving the, giving us the motion or adding uh, to it? I, I just want to clarify one thing, but then I'm happy to give the motion afterwards. Um, you. you probably covered it, I'm sure it's in your sub notes, but uh, as far as the street front goes, uh, specifically the Enbridge utility locker, our understanding is there's about a 12 foot frontage that takes up commercial space and anything we can do to collaborate, uh, if, if councillors can help, let us know, but that's not something, I mean, that's almost a whole, that could be a little coffee shop or something there. Uh, so anything we can do to, to help with that and, and find best practices and mitigate it would be appreciated. Uh, and I, I'm willing to move it as well. Thank you very much, Councillor. Is there any objection to the motion? Madam Clerk, there's no objection. And so Councillor McNeese's motion succeeds. Thank you, Councillor. Council, let's turn now to the public meeting and recommendation report, item 6.2 for the zoning bylaw amendment and draft plan of subdivision for BCIMC Realty Corp. And we have a presentation from Robert Thun, our senior planner. Mr. Thun, we are all ears. Thank you, Your Worship and members of council. So in May of 2011, a zoning bylaw amendment and draft plan of subdivision application was submitted by BCIMC Realty Corp for the development of 75 hectares of land on the north side of Dundas Street West between Regional Road 25 and Tremaine Road. And that application came in for the development of a employment subdivision. The original public meeting on this was December 12th, 2011. So given the passage of time, it's necessary that we have a public meeting and a recommendation report together. So that is the reason why I'm here tonight. That report can be found as item 6.2 of tonight's agenda. And your worship, just with all uh, public meetings, um, there is a telephone number on the screen. It's 905-815-6095, should any member of the public wish to uh, provide public input into this process. Next slide, please. On the screen before you right now is an air photo uh, identifying the site with the bold, dark uh, outline and the star. As a, once again, uh, Tremaine Road is to the, uh, if I can use the, oh, if we can go back, please. Tremaine Road is to the bottom of the screen where my cursor is. Regional Road 25 is to the top. Highway 407 is to the north and Dundas Street, a regional major arterial road is to the south. As you can see from the air photo itself, the air is predominantly agricultural in nature right now. Um, there is one employment use to the east of this property. It is, um, used to be called Xenon and it's been several other uh, companies that have taken over that property. I believe the latest is Su Suez Technologies. To the west are lands that are presently owned by the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, they have contacted us once they saw this application come forward for uh, development of their property at the same time. To the south, you'll see there is residential, but that is separated from the employment uses that are on the north side of Dundas Street by Regional Road, uh, by Dundas Street, which is a 50 meter wide right of way. Also on the screen, you'll see that the site is bisected by the main 14 Mile Creek, which is at the north, closer to the Suez Technologies building, and also by several tributaries associated with the 14 Mile Creek. Uh, there are three that actually go through this site. 
3367 Dundas Street West is a farm property. It has been purchased by a development group that we have had pre-consultation meetings with already on the redevelopment of that site. It is also a property of heritage interest, so that is also being considered as part of any redevelopment of the site. With regards to the subject property again, uh, 3269 and 3271 Dundas Street are the municipal address for the entire property. That's for the entire 75 hectares of land. However, the farmstead, the original farmstead for that property itself is in the bottom, uh, I'll call it east corner, uh, where my arrow is right now. So that farmstead uh, portions of that will be conserved and restored. Uh, matters have already come for forward with Heritage Oakville. It is also, as I said, a heritage listed property. So there is a heritage interest there also. And the conservation management plan discussions are on page 27. So the entire heritage uh, discussion is related to the site is on page 27. Next slide, please. What's on the screen right now, your worship and members of council is the original draft plan of subdivision application from uh, the December meeting of 2011 to the tr latest draft plan of subdivision. So you'll see things have progressed quite a bit since that time. The applicant itself uh, with regards to the latest proposal is proposing, uh, maybe difficult on your screen, maybe not, uh, but blocks one down where my cursor is, blocks three B and block six for service area employment. So that will provide you with a, uh, a variety of employment uses, including service employment uses. Then you have blocks two along Dundas Street, 3A, B, or 3C, I should say, block four, five on the far side, on the east side, uh, seven and eight. They are for light and general employment uses as envisioned by the North Oakville West Secondary Plan. Blocks nine to 11. Block nine is a stormwater management pond in phase 1A. Block 10 is a stormwater management pond, which is the existing farm pond, which will be repurposed for stormwater management purposes. It is a very large pond that was created by the farmer many years ago for farming purposes, and it will be repurposed now. There is also a block 11, which is a very small portion uh, where my cursor is right now, that will get developed in the fullness of time with the Roman Catholic Church lands to the west. Block 20, or blocks 12 to 15. Block 12, where my cursor is right now, represents the a creek block. Block 13 is a consolidated creek block. Block 14 is the creek block. And block 15 is also a creek block. Just for council's information, the width of these creek blocks, where my cursor is, uh, block 14 is roughly 135 meters wide. So that's longer than a football field for uh, a creek block. When you get to a consolidated area where my star is, that's in the order of 200, 230, 240 meters wide. And that's as a result of the three water courses north of Arterial One being consolidated. Um, for the information as the members of council who were with the secondary plan when it was put in place, there's a hierarchy of water courses. To the south, block 14 is a red water course, so that can't be touched. So that's defined by things like the top of bank, top of bank setbacks, meander belts, fisheries concerns. Whereas you get the block 13, block 12, and the consolidation of it, that's a blue stream. So you can modify those streams, you can consolidate those streams to create what we have before you today. Um, as an example, where the water courses are for council's information, you've got one that's where my cursor is right now. That's actually a green stream. Then you work your way west, you have a water course there, that's a blue stream. And then further underneath all the lines that you see there, there's another blue stream. So the efforts and the, the reason why it's taken so long to come back to council is the complexity of the combination of all those water courses and its relocation and try and make sure that fisheries, uh, floodplains, uh, you name it, are all addressed according to the North Oak Falls Creek Subwatershed Study. <coughs> Similarly, Block 15 uh, was designed between protecting what's there right now and the relocation of the watercourse that is in that area. 
Block 26 down at the bottom here where my cursor is, is where the farmstead is. And that is to be repurposed and restored. So a portion of that subdivision is reflecting that heritage interest and the protection of the heritage interest that we have seen for that property. So a portion of that property, Block 26, is to be conveyed to the municipality for heritage interest. Block 27, as a final part, is right at Highway 407. Extensive efforts and discussions were undertaken with uh, MTO, the 407 branch, on the limits of what the expansion of the 407 would be. And that expansion is for bus rapid transit. It's not for making the highway wider, it's for bus rapid transit. So it will go from Burlington all the way to, I believe it's Markham, okay? On the screen also, you will see a 1A, a 1B, and a 2. Those are the phasing schemes for the development of the site. The whole site will not be developed all at once. The creek block will not be built in the first phase. So 1A basically represents the development of the land from the west side of the proposed NHS towards the old Burton Stables and the Roman Catholic Church property. So it's, it's basically the triangle that's being created right there with Avenue 2, Dundas Street, and the Natural Heritage System. 1B will reflect all the lands to the east, save and except where the number 2 is. So the dividing line there will be Avenue 3. Next slide, please. From an urban design perspective, you will see on uh, figure three there, it is employment and natural heritage system and it does reflect the Highway 407 corridor. From the secondary plan, the North Oakville West secondary plan, which was approved in May of 2009, uh, the lands are employment and natural heritage system and there is a recognition of the expansion of Highway 407. Section 8652 of the secondary plan does provide you with a list of permitted uses within the employment district, or in the employment district designation, I should say, but also provides you with some locational criteria. And that's why you'll see through the zoning bylaw amendment, there are certain things that can go in certain areas. And that's why the service areas in one location, light employment and general employment are in different locations. It also provides for the secondary plan a discussion on the retail and the service commercial uses and their locational criteria. If I could have put the previous slide on to this slide right now, you'll see that the road pattern is slightly different, but it does maintain the grid pattern that was established for the North Oakville process. Be it the east or the west, we always wanted to maintain a grid pattern for ease of getting from one place to another. Um, as I had mentioned, it has been a while. It has been quite a while, 12 years since the application was first submitted. But we had to look at things like the creation of the NHS, the, sub or the water course consolidation, the transportation issues, the servicing. Those are, all start those are all discussed on page 20, but those are very complex, being that this is the first subdivision within that area, which we call 407 West. So that's Tremaine to Regional Road 25. So we had to deal with Conservation Halton, the region, MTO, a bunch of other agencies, just to make sure that we captured everything in this subdivision. And overall, I believe that this does conform to the North Oakville West Secondary Plan, what's proposed before you tonight. Next slide, please. As you can see from this slide, it's FD right now, future development, the existing zoning on the property and Schedule A from bylaw 2023-014 uh, is on the right-hand side. So to implement the vision of the West Plan for this site, the proposed bylaw that I just mentioned proposes to revise the zoning schedule as seen on the screen to the various zone categories with uh, special provisions. It identifies additional permitted uses to support the development of the employment area. This is the first employment area that council has seen in quite a few years. Um, and the last one was actually from a board hearing. So this is the actual first one that went through council directly. Um, introduces LE zone regulations. So that's a light employment zone regulations 
for the areas abutting the 407. And that's with regards to where the building can be located and parking in relation to the property itself. And those are similar to what we're implementing uh, along the QEW in South Oakville. It introduces uh, in the general employment and the light employment, a minimum 7.5 meter yard setback from the proposed NHS. Along the NHS, you will, uh, well, you won't see it here, but there are uh, infiltration trenches that are necessary to support the cold water and the red side days habitat in the red area portions of the water courses. So all that will be taken into account when designing the subdivisions. So uh, once again, we are maintaining a fisheries concern that was brought to us by MNR at the time. G, uh, General Employment Special Provision 86 also introduces a 10 meter landscape strip along the park block. That is there as a protection mechanism for the development to the heritage property, or I should say the heritage property from the employment area. So as part of the conservation uh, management strategy, there was a buffer uh, proposed. We have now quantified that into a 10 meter landscape strip. The Sony bylaw also excludes retail stores in the service area and employment uh, zone. We want this to be uh, uses that are complementary to the employment area and not have large format retail being introduced to our employment areas. So that would turn it more into a commercial nature in which we do not want to do. It also permits water and wastewater service to trans, uh, traverse a small portion of the NHS where the park is and that's uh, associated with the existing gravel driveway. There is a driveway that goes up to the farmstead right now. It is in that location that temporary water and wastewater services to support phase 1B are proposed until those are decommissioned and put into the extension of Colonel William uh, Parkway north connecting up to Avenue 3. There's also a 9 meter minimum height for the first 60 meters for the lots abutting Dundas Street. Um, there is no minimum height in North Oakville West Secondary Plan at this time. Um, there's only a maximum of 15 stories. So we are trying to get some height along the Dundas Street frontage uh, for at least the first 60 meters to provide that street edge. In addition to uh, the zoning regulations, uh, there are three holes that are associated with each of the phases that I previously spoke about. And those relate to municipal services, the creek crossing uh, of uh, the main, or the 14 mile creek tributary, there's fire prevention matters, and there's also a holding related to the extension of Colonel William northward. But the full amendment uh, can be found in Appendix C to tonight's uh, agenda. Next slide, please. So your worship, I've spoken a lot about technical matters being reviewed by agencies and departments, but we've also had extensive efforts with the general public. There were landowners coordination meetings at the onset of this process. Uh, we met with all the landowners between Regional Road 25 and Tremaine Road, north of Dundas. Um, and that was to make sure that they were informed of what was being proposed on the various matters. And more so, it was proposed to show that the development would not impact their ability to develop in the future. So as you saw in the air photo, there was employment on both sides of the uh, of this site. They are not impacted at all in their developability. They can continue on with what is being proposed right now. And that discussion, uh, your worship, is on page 28 of uh, tonight's report. And there's also, uh, looking at the agenda from tonight, there is correspondence from the abutting landowner to the west from Burton Stables for council's consideration. So in, in conclusion, Your Worship, it's been a long haul on this one, if I can use that phrase. And uh, staff are putting forth the following recommendation, as you see on the screen, for council's consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thun. Uh, Councillor Elgar, do you have a question for Mr. Thun? Uh, yes, through you, Mayor Burden, to uh, to Rob Thun. Um, Rob, what changed with the red stream where we don't have a 15 meter setback anymore, like we did a, a directly across the road on the south side of Dundas, which was the Monarch Golf Course, which is now fully developed? I believe that was a 15 meter setback for the same water course. 
through your worship to Councillor Elgar, actually it's the the setbacks for the water courses are actually much bigger. When I mentioned the water course south of Arterial 1 is 135 or 150 meters wide, it incorporates all those buffers, the meander belts, the buffers itself. There's buffers along the edges where the uh, where the development limit has to respect and for buffering purposes of the development to the actual valley itself. So we have taken the consideration into that. 15 meters is typically on the larger water courses, seven and a half meters on the smaller water courses. We've looked at this differently in North Oakville and looked at it holistically based on all the technical requirements, be it top of bank, be it buffers, be it uh, meander belts, be it fisheries concerns. And the worst of all those is the limit that's being proposed today. So the 15 meter, which is directly across the road on the south side of Dundas, it doesn't, I thought I heard you say north, north it was 7.5. So I misheard then, is that what happened? Yeah. Yes, it wasn't, sir. you didn't say 7.5 meters? 7.5 meters. Is what I do, you yes. did say. Yes. Right. So what happens when you cross the road and go south of Dundas and went to 15? The top of the valley itself narrows quite a bit there. The top of bank setback is already captured in the walkway trail system. The walkway trail on the north oak on the north side will be captured within the west side of the water course and through the stormwater management pond all the way up to Avenue 3, then we'll connect to the west. So the, but so the, the, buffer, the buffers okay. are already established in in the uh, in the creek blocks that are being proposed right now. Okay, just so I understand, how did that differ from the buffers or the seven to fifteen meter setback on the monarch lands? I remember both Keith in, Bird and I back in the early two thousands uh, fought about. Through your worship, there are two pl different planning regimes. You've got the the South Oakville proposal, and then you've got the North Oakville Creeks watershed uh, requirements that are, have to be adhered here. So okay, it, it, so the okay they they change they changed them they shrunk, got it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Mr. Thun, did you want to add anything? No, Your Worship. Alrighty, uh, Councillor Hazlitt Teal. Thank you for that detailed presentation. Um, I have two questions, just of clarity. So, Bill ninety seven, from uh, and that change around employment areas. Um, so larger scale warehousing would be allowed in this area? I'm sorry, Councillor, can you repeat that? Will, uh, will, quote, large scale warehousing be allowed? Warehousing is permitted as a use in North Oakville. Okay. And, uh, and because it's referenced on, in, uh, in the report on page 30, do we have a definition of large scale warehousing? Or is it just that warehousing is allowed? I do not have a definition of what large scale warehousing is, but it is a permitted use. Okay. And the transportation flow, if it ends up uh, being a warehouse, all of that's been vetted in terms of flow directly out of the, uh, uh, out of the employment area to the 407? Through you, your worship, to Councillor Hazel Thiel, warehousing is not the only use that's permitted here. So the studies that were undertaken with regards to transportation looked at the secondary plan permitted uses in totality with regards to how movements would occur. So as it stands right now, you would, you would be going out to Dundas Street and then going to Dundas Street to Regional Road 25 and out to the 407, okay? In the fullness of time, Arterial 1 will go from Tremaine Road to Regional Road 25 directly and not, not need to go to Dundas Street. So the transportation study was vetted by our transportation engineering department and deemed satisfactory. We even went back to look at the TIS in relation to the Evergreen subdivision to the west in Burlington and make sure that the uses that were being proposed there along with the uses that were being proposed on this site and our road widths are acceptable and it was determined to be acceptable. Thank you for clarifying that for me. Thank you, councillors. Um, Madam Clerk, uh, as I understand worship, it, we just, have a Just one thing of Mr. clarification. Um, I was just informed by the planner that worked on the Madame subdivision 
the actual buffer counts for Elgar is seven and a half, not 15. Huh. All right. Thank you for the clarification. Madam Clerk, we have registered delegations, I believe. Would you call them? First delegation is Tony Sandu. Now he is here. I'm not sure if he still wishes to delegate or not. Mr. Sandu, you're welcome. And we look forward to your information. Um, your worship and members of council, I emailed um, my letter directly to you, all of you, just so you're aware. In fact, uh, just Rob Tan very in detail told about this subdivision. My property is next door to it. And I remember clearly in, I believe in 2011 sometime when it was brought forward. So the grid pattern, road pattern was a little bit shifted from uh, North Oak Field West Secondary Plan, from Town's Plan, and my land was a little left like um, uh, landlocked kind of thing. But anyways, I complained about that at that time. And what I want to say is, and since then you yourself told Rob that Mr. Sanders should be satisfied because I don't live here much. I go back and forth. So I've been following up all the submissions, going through the things, and I think so they did a great job and uh, followed all the principles and guidelines for North Oak West Secondary Plan. Uh, Mr. Tan, Quadriel, and their planning staff have been updating me how things are going. So I'm fully satisfied as a neighbor and a landowner next door, and uh, I'm, I'm in favor of this uh, project. Thank you very much for taking the time to share that with us. Thank you. Um, Madam Clerk. The next delegation is Francis Borgest. Ms. Borges, is she joining us in person or by Zoom? Uh, no, she should be here in person, but I guess she has not appeared. Let me just check. Ms. Borges, are you here? Oh, she is. Oh. Sorry, she is. Oh, she is virtual, so she's coming on. All right. We will virtually connect at the speed of virtual connections. Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you very well. I believe we all can hear you. Thank you. Oh, hi. Um, uh, no, I, I was here just listening. This is my first time. Uh, I guess living in um, just south of Dundas in the Colonel William kind of pocket, um, I'm just more concerned about uh, flooding. So um, if that could be maybe put in the memo for future observation of, you know, the planning, that would be awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Um, Councillor Elger. Uh, yes, thank you. Through Mayor Burton. I wonder if uh, Mr. Sun could just clarify that the, the whole of that 14 mile creek going through, through uh, Richview was actually seven. I know there was a pinch point 7.5, but the rest was 15 to my understanding, uh, looking at the all the OMB decisions on that one. Was it 100% of all the 14 mile creek was 7.5 meters? Through your worship, one moment. Through your, your worship, uh, if we wouldn't mind taking this offline, we'll get back to Councillor Elgar on this buffer issue. I would really appreciate that because I've got documentation quite different. So thank you. Councillor Nanda. Thank you, Mayor Burton. Just a quick question for you. Is there going to be any abutting land that's going to have residential with any of the employment lands? Through you, Councillor or through your worship to councillor, uh, no, the only residential will be to the south and that's there already. Oh, thank you. All right, 
Council, I think we're at a decision point. Uh, technically, I think this is your area, Councillor Nanda and Councillor Shi. Which of you might like to accommodate us with a motion? <laughs> Councillor Shi, thank you. You you won the contest. Uh, is there any objection to the motion? Councillor Shi, congratulations. Uh, your your motion carries unanimously. Council, that brings us to our discussion items. And uh, the first one is a information report on uh, the review of warehousing and distribution industries. We have a presentation from Brad Sunderland, our senior planner in policy planning. And Mr. Sunderland, uh, there's great council interest in this, so I'm pretty sure we'll be all eyes and ears for this. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of council. Um, so tonight's presentation on the warehousing and distribution industries review um, is item 7.1 on tonight's agenda. And a large part of my, uh, I'm just introducing the uh, consultant actually, that's gonna do the, the bulk of the presentation this evening. But um, staff uh, did prepare this report in response to a council motion from May 25th of 2021. Uh, where Council sought the review of a warehousing and, and distribution industries, uh, mainly noting concerns with the current zoning definition of warehouse and that they, it doesn't adequately reflect the current practice of the industry today. So in October of 2022, staff hired Meridian Planning Consulting to complete the warehousing and distribution industries review to address Council's motion. The consultant report is attached as Appendix A to the staff report in front of Council this evening and provides recommendations for town staff to consider as part of the ongoing official plan review, as well as the future comprehensive zoning bylaw review. The consultant report highlights that the town's official plan policies and zoning regulations for warehousing and distribution industries generally, generally reflect municipal best practices and continue to implement uh, provincial and regional plans and policies. The recommendations provided in the report could, however, if implemented, strengthen land use compatibility considerations and provide a harmonized regulatory zoning approach townwide. So staff will consider the key findings, recommendations, and the accompanying, uh, accompanying council discussion from tonight's meeting uh, to inform our next steps and the development of future official plan policies uh, and or zoning regulations as necessary. So with that, uh, town staff will actually be turning the floor over to Allison Luoma, uh, Senior Project Manager at Meridian Consulting to prevent, uh, present their warehousing and dis distribution report for Council's information. Uh, I believe Allison is joining us virtually. She has indeed. Thank you, Mr. Sunderland. Um, Ms. Luoma, uh, welcome. We look forward to your uh, details. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor Burton and members of council. Can I just confirm first, everybody can hear me just fine? You are loud yes. and clear. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, so what I'll do then is I'll just launch uh, immediately into the presentation. So if I could have the next slide, please. So we do have a little bit to go through here tonight. Uh, we'll start with a brief introduction. Uh, and we will then look at uh, essentially the nature of the use. So we'll distinguish between warehouse uses and distribution centers, some of their operational requirements, uh, some land use compatibility considerations for those sorts of uses. Uh, then we'll look at the mechanisms available to the town to regulate these uses. So provincial policy direction, zoning, uh, additional regulatory tools. And then we'll also look at some of the case studies that we examined in the process. Uh, and then uh, we will wrap up with a, a number of highlights in the findings. And uh, as council is well aware, uh, on April the 6th, we had the release of Bill 97 uh, and uh, the draft provincial planning statement. So I will touch on that at the end of the presentation as this report was actually completed in advance of those provincial uh, policies coming forward. So we, we've tacked that on to the end. Next slide, please. So in terms of uh, characterizing the use in, in the introduction, uh, warehousing and distribution centers have long been recognized as a common land use within employment areas. Um, this use has evolved at a rapid pace. Uh, you know, COVID-19 especially uh, put a fast pace on that. And in response to the changing commerce patterns and quicker on-demand delivery requirements for goods. Um, this trend, I understand in Oakville in particular, has been reflected in a number of recent uh, 
planning applications for warehouse and distribution uses. Next slide, please. So there were three key objectives to the study uh, that we were to undertake. The first was to provide an overview of the current trends and characteristics. The second was to look at some compatibility matters uh, between these uses and surrounding land uses, uh, and then to recommend some policy and regulatory approaches uh, for guiding development of warehousing and distribution center land uses within the town. Next slide, please. So the purpose of this study is really uh, to inform uh, the next round of planning uh, activities that are happening and studies. So uh, the ongoing official plan review and uh, to inform the development of the future zoning bylaw review uh, in terms of putting some regulatory mechanisms in place. Next slide, please. So in terms of looking at the use and characterizing it, um, warehouse development comes in many shapes and sizes each serving a specific role depending on the nature of the operations and the supply chain being supported. Um, both a warehouse and a distribution center provide storage and shipping to varying degrees and for varying lengths of time. Uh, both require a larger building footprint uh, and both primarily rely on road networks uh, to access uh, their transportation needs and the end destination for goods. Um, the biggest difference between a distribution and uh, a distribution center and a warehouse is that a distribution center is not designed for long-term storage. Um, these facilities are generally designed to move product quickly, product in, product out. Next slide, please. So at a very high level, this is just some comparisons between the two, the two types of uses. So in terms of providing storage, uh, a warehouse feeds into the manufacturing process to store either raw materials or even final goods, uh, whereas the distribution center is more of a logistics center. Uh, so it is redirecting uh, goods and services from one, one place to another. Um, historically, uh, warehouses have maintained larger inventories over longer periods of time, whereas the distribution center, uh, they will have more uh, non-static inventories and uh, potentially smaller inventories with much shorter turnaround times. The focus there is very much on inventory management and packaging and the, the shipping services associated with that. Uh, warehouses uh, generally or historically have been owned by a manufacturer or the user of the goods that are, are in those buildings. Um, distribution centers can be owned and operated by a third party fulfillment company. Next slide, please. Warehouses tend to be larger spaces, fewer employees. Uh, distribution centers still very much larger spaces, but uh, by the nature of the activities within those buildings, they have many more employees, um, which would also go towards parking requirements as well. Uh, warehouses tend to be uh, lower in height. And in that regard, we're talking about gross floor area. Uh, whereas in the distribution and fulfillment centers, they're um, larger uh, building footprints, but we're talking about cubic space for, for storage. And so we're also looking at increased heights. Um, two more. Uh, so in terms of warehouse uses, um, they are traditionally and comparatively not as automated when compared to distribution uh, centers, which are highly automated. And the warehousing uh, historically has supplied brick and mortar stores, whereas these distribution and fulfillment centers have really come on board with a sharpened focus on e-commerce. Next slide, please. So in terms of the operational requirements, um, both require large lots to acquire, uh, to, sorry, to accommodate those larger building footprints and in particular, the traffic circulation requirements on those lots, um, that is, truck traffic into, into and out of loading bays, but that is also the parking for employees that are in those facilities. Um, again, the refocus from square footage to cubic footage, um, the more sophisticated approach to traffic circulation, um, convenient access to transportation networks, including 400 series highways is particularly important. Uh, and there are also increased utility and uh, requirements uh, to provide for that increased automation. So in particular, hydro. Uh, next slide, please. 
So the second objective was to look at land use compatibility matters between uh, warehousing distribution uses and surrounding land uses. Um, employment areas within provincial policy within that framework, employment areas are to be protected uh, from the encroachment of non-employment uses that may restrict the operation or expansion of uh, those employment land uses. Um, Matters of compatibility, uh, they have to be considered in respect both of the siting and viability of the employment uses, but also as well as in the establishment of new sensitive land uses uh, that may be impacted by the existing or planned uh, employment lands. So, it, I mean, it really does go in two directions there. Next slide, please. So land use compatibility between employment areas and uh, non-employment uh, lands is really best served by development practices that avoid adverse impacts or where avoidance is not possible by minimizing and mitigating impacts to within acceptable levels. This really is the underlying premise of our provincial policy framework. So avoidance first, and if avoidance is not possible, then we minimize and we mitigate. Um, that that is uh, one of the fundamentals of our provincial policy statement now, uh, especially going forward in the draft provincial planning statement that is carried forward as the, the foundational premise. Um, it's not only a matter of avoiding these adverse impacts, uh, but it's also providing for the long term operational and economic viability of the individual uses and the function of the employment area as a whole. And generally speaking, the best mechanism uh, to accommodate or to manage land use compatibility is separation distances between incompatible uses and mitigation measures where this isn't possible. Um, in terms of separation distances, this isn't necessarily something where you say something must actually be set back, but it could also be a gradient in uses or even a gradient in zoning where you have intervening uses between the employment area and the sensitive uses. You, you may have commercial a commercial area intervening between the two that in effect provides that separation. Next slide, please. So in terms of the provincial policy that we have right now, uh, the two main documents in Oakville are the Provincial Policy Statement uh, 2020 and the Growth Plan for the Great, Greater Golden Horseshoe 2020. But as I uh, mentioned earlier, we do have this new draft Provincial Planning Statement, which was released in April. If that draft Provincial Planning Statement, uh, well not if, when, is actually approved, uh, it will replace those other two documents. So it will actually bring together the growth plan and the, the existing PPS into this new provincial planning statement that will replace the two of them together. Next slide, please. So in terms of the current provincial policy direction, and I can also speak to in the draft uh, planning statement as well, uh, warehousing is not specifically de uh, defined, um, nor does the provincial policy make any distinction between warehousing or a distribution center. Uh, so at a provincial level, warehousing uh, is simply identified as a use permitted within an employment area. So to that, uh, to that end, the current Town of Oakville official plan and the zoning framework are consistent with provincial policy um, and that it does not distinguish between warehousing or a distribution center. Next slide, please. So uh, there are two zoning bylaws in effect in the town of Oakville. Um, one uh, is under the uh, 1984 uh, official plan and secondary plans that apply to North Oakville. The other applies to the balance of the, the lands in the town. Um, both of the zoning bylaws regulate warehousing as a permitted use. However, the standards between the two zoning bylaws vary significantly. And, and really there's two reasons for this. Um, one, Oakville has a number of employment areas, all of which differ in terms of the type of warehousing uses, the vintage of the uses, the size and configuration of the parcel fabric, you know, access points, uh, access to higher levels of transportation. So it, uh, very locational um, in terms of their characteristics. And the second is that in the North Oakville secondary plan area, these employment uses are governed by a wholly different policy framework being the 1984 official plan and secondary plans and the zoning frameworks. Uh, they reflect those policy differences. Next slide, please. 
So aside from the official plan and zoning, um, there is also some additional regulatory mechanisms uh, that the town can rely on. These are uh, supporting, think of them as supporting characters or supporting mechanisms to the primary land use, um, which is the OP and the zoning. Um, but we can, there's also a number of things that are offered under, well, there's conforming to the policy structures of the provincial policy statement. Uh, in, in particular, addressing the land use compatibility through the development approval process, um, the use of urban design guidelines, uh, better integration of transportation and land use planning, um, use of the Municipal Act bylaws to reinforce planning policy, and uh, the provincial land use compatibility guidelines, which are issued under the Environmental Protection Act. And I will go through each of these subsequently in this presentation, so we'll We'll come back to each of them in turn. Next slide, please. So in looking at um, a best practices review, we chose a number of case studies. Um, these are all studies that uh, have a similar context to the town of Oakville. They're all within uh, essentially the GTA more or less. They are municipalities of a similar size. And there are also municipalities that have um, higher level provincial corridors through them, so 400 series highways, to give uh, as much of an apples to apple comparison as we could. Next slide, please. So uh, consistent with the provincial policy statement and the Town of Oakville official plan, uh, in the case studies, warehousing is identified as an employment use. Um, within those official plans, um, not necessarily defined though as such. It's just identified as being a use permitted within an employment area. Uh, and it is in fact the employment area that is defined and that is uh, in conformity with the definition contained in the provincial policy statement. Next slide, please. So in looking at the comprehensive zoning bylaws for each of the case studies, um, they do define either warehousing or in some cases it was warehousing slash distribution center. Uh, and they are permitted within various of the employment zones. Um, the zoning bylaws that we looked at in the case studies, however, do not make any distinction between a warehouse and a distribution center. And they essentially regulate these as a singular use. Next slide, please. So key findings for the official plan. Um, it's recommended that warehousing and distribution centers continue to be recognized uh, as a permitted use within employment areas, but not to be more specifically defined within the official plan. Um, it's not recommended that this distinction be made at an official plan level. Um, the existing policy framework in Oakville is consistent with a provincial policy and this recommendation continues to be consistent with provincial policy. Next slide, please. So the land use compatibility, com compatibility policies addressing uh, both employment areas and sensitive land uses uh, within the Oakville official plan could be strengthened uh, to provide better policy metrics for the avoidance of encroachment between employment lands and other sensitive land uses, as well as establishing a better interface between compatible land uses. Um, the locational policies for employment areas uh, could be strengthened to place a greater emphasis on the integration of transportation and land use planning, in particular to protect those employment lands in proximity of those major transportation corridors. Next slide, please. So key findings for zoning bylaw. Um, there are some elements of the two zoning bylaws that are in effect in the town. Uh, that would benefit from a more standard approach to regulating warehouse and distribution uh, uses across the two bylaws. This would provide for a more consistent approach to regulating this use uh, across the town. In doing so, we have put forward a, a recommended new definition uh, that would be uh, replaced in each of the bylaws um, as follows means a premises used for the indoor storage and freight distribution of goods, wares, merchandise, substances, articles, or products, but shall not include a commercial self-storage use, wholesale or retail outlet, transportation terminal, storage of fuel, storage or transfer of waste, or any other use or establishment as may otherwise be defined herein. 
So this definition, um, it is consistent with the two definitions in your existing bylaws. They're, again, they're not the same. They're not identical in your existing definitions, but they are more or less consistent with each other. And um, this definition is also a reflection of some of the case studies we looked at in particular where uh, it zeroed in on um, those uses that were not considered to be a warehouse or distribution center, just to give some clarity to the use. Next slide, please. Uh, so the scale of warehousing and distribution uses could be more effectively regulated through the application of minimum uh, and or maximum gross floor area requirements. Uh, so you have the definition um, that, that provides for what exactly that use is. But then in terms of regulating how large or how small they would be, that would actually be regulated separately within the zone standards so that you wouldn't have um, different definitions uh, for these uses. It would be one singular definition and then the size or scale of the use is actually managed through the regs in behind it. Um, this, the size applied would depend on the geography or in terms of particular zones. This could be done uh, as a notation in the permitted use table, or it could be done as an overlay zone in the zoning. There's a, there's a number of different ways we could do that. Um, zoning bylaw setbacks, uh, while they are one means to assist in achieving separation distance, uh, it's equally imperative that new or expanded sensitive land uses uh, not be permitted to establish in proximity of lands that have already been developed for employment uses or are planned to be a, a developed for employment uses. Um, so that really comes down to uh, some of the, the land use and zone structures that are in place. Uh, it is recommended that the town consider removal of permissions for warehousing uses from the service area employment zone uh, up in North Oakville. Uh, however, <laughs> a little caveat there, now that we have this new provincial planning statement, um, that recommendation I think will need to be reviewed within the larger review of the employment areas that is going to have to happen on the heels of this new provincial planning statement. So there's a little asterisk beside that one. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, it is recommended that the locational and setback requirements for loading facilities be harmonized across the bylaw. Um, in doing so, attention must be given to the appropriate setback the extent of any legal non-conformity that may or may not be created, and any policy direction in the official plan or secondary plan as it relates to loading facilities in particular. One of the things that became uh, evident as I was working through this is that um, th there really needs to be almost an existing conditions study set out that starts with a mapping exercise that maps where the current employment lands are, um, especially where those lands are in relation to uh, sensitive land uses that may be either immediately adjacent or in proximity to them, then to be reviewed, that mapping exercise to be reviewed in the context of Bill 97 and the new provincial planning statement in terms of what will now be considered an employment area, which employment areas in Oakville will remain, which will need to be restructured or changed, that is well beyond the scope of this uh, exercise, but is something that I know staff are already starting to turn their mind to. And so I think I've actually just jumped a fit ahead a few recommendations, but that's okay. Um, in terms of a parking study, there does need to be a parking, parking study undertaken to inform uh, the comprehensive zoning bylaw review. Uh, to specifically address the parking requirements for warehousing and distribution uses, I can tell you in looking at the case studies, Parking was all over the map. It, it, was, it varied significantly across all of the case studies. Uh, there really was no one trend or even approximate best practice there. They varied so much. So there really does need to be a parking study that would feed into your zoning bylaw review um, that would give some direction to that within the Oakville context. Next slide, please. Okay, so there's the, deep, the detailed mapping exercise uh, that I just spoke of. Um, 
It's also recommended that part of the zoning bylaw review that additional consideration be given to landscape buffers in regards to both um, the mitigative properties of these buffers. They are primarily visual screening versus noise attenuation, um, but also within the larger context of the town's environmental and sustainability objectives as well, uh, which would feed into any planning exercise. Next slide, please. So additional regulatory mechanisms. Um, there were a number of mechanisms uh, that I identified earlier that can be considered uh, to address land use compatibility. Um, so land use compatibility can be addressed through various studies that would be required as part of the development application process. Uh, the requirement for such studies is determined on a site by site or application basis. Um, this is also triggered in part uh, at, towards the back of the official plan when we look at complete application um, requirements and there's a list of studies that uh, may be identified in, or required to support a development application. But in regards to warehousing and distribution uses specifically, there's engineering considerations such as noise or a vibration study, urban design considerations and a landscape plan, uh, environmental considerations in terms of an air quality report, um, transportation or other health and safety measures. So uh, through the development approval process, there are a number of studies um, that can be identified to address various matters of land use compatibility. Next slide, please. Uh, urban design guidelines, uh, they may be used in conjunction with official plan policy directives as well as zoning uh, regulations uh, and at the site plan level uh, and can address matters of built form. Um, better integration of transportation and land use planning in particular, uh, I know in February of 2022, uh, Council endorsed the Oakville Urban Mobility and Transportation Study. And within that strategy, it includes a focus on the efficient movement of goods and freight as a component and a user of the transportation network. Uh, so a greater into integration between those two efforts. Um, municipal Act bylaws, uh, these really truly are supporting caste, so to speak, um, in and of themselves, uh, you know, they, they won't uh, affect a, a significant change but in conjunction with zoning and official plan policy, it, it begins to put a, a more full picture together. Um, but those sorts of bylaws include a fence bylaw, tree protection bylaw, um, public nuisance bylaw, which covers off things like um, dust, vibration, uh, smoke, you know, anything like that, uh, and an anti-idling bylaw. Next slide, please. So the provincial, uh, the D6 guidelines, the land use compatibility guidelines, they are issued under the Environmental Protection Act. Uh, these guidelines, uh, they do three things. They establish three categories of industrial land uses and associated impacts. They identify potential influence areas for each of those categories, as well as a recommended minimum separation distance between industrial land uses and surrounding sensitive land uses. Um, and the only thing I would point out here too is that um, these are recommended and these, uh, these guidelines are triggered when there's a development application and through agency review. Uh, it is MOE who administers these or comments on these in conjunction with the municipality who actually is the one that at the end of the day implements them when the rubber hits the road based on the input from, uh, from MOE. Next slide, please. Uh, so warehousing distribution centers really do not fit with any one of the land use categories identified in the guideline. Uh, rather, it, it's a hybrid between class one and class two industrial facility. Um, this is in part due to the frequency of the truck traffic, the size of facilities, the hours of operation, um, the frequency of outputs, whether that's noise or light or, or whatever it may be, but it, it doesn't fit nicely within this structure. So it really is a hybrid between class one and two, which also means that the potential influence area and uh, the separation distances equally range because we have this hybrid situation. So the potential influence area could be anywhere between 70 to 300 meters, and the separation distance could be anywhere from 20 to 70 meters, 
but that depends on the individual facility and if that is assessed on a site by site or application by application basis. Next slide, please. Okay, so Bill 97 and the draft uh, provincial planning statement, um, just to show you, uh, you know, where the, um, the modifications are. So this is the definition for an employment area, and I've essentially redlined it from what we have now to what is being proposed in uh, the new policy, sorry, the new planning statement. Um, so anything in red, I would point out to you has been uh, struck out of the definition going forward. And importantly, it's that clause, but not limited to, which under the current provincial policy statement, what is listed in the definition are examples, not necessarily requirements. But because that not limited to has been removed, it has very much narrowed those uses that are permitted within an employment area of what's considered an employment area. And what I wanted to highlight there is that warehousing continues to be identified as a key use within an employment area and things like uh, offices have been removed uh, out of the definition. So uses that are excluded from the employment areas are institutional and commercial, including retail and office not associated with the primary employment uses listed above. So in a go forward basis, the province still does not distinguish between warehousing and distribution uses. Um, the proposed zoning definition for a warehouse and distribution, distribution center as provided through this study remains consistent with the revised definition in the, the provincial planning statement. Uh, and warehousing and distribution center uses remain within the more narrow focus of uses permitted within employment areas. Next slide, please. In terms of locational requirements, uh, the, the new planning statement carries forward the emphasis on protecting employment lands in proximity of the uh, highway, the major transportation corridors, including the 400 series highways. Um, the province does not carry forward the concept of provincially significant employment areas in the provincial planning statement. Uh, currently, that is uh, included within the growth plan. And I'm not sure that we've seen the end of that at this point. Um, the province has asked for suggestions in terms of a different approach in identifying significant employment areas, uh, but it is not proposed to be carried forward in the planning statement. Um, this doesn't really affect the recommendations of, of the report in, in one direction or the other. Next slide, please. And in terms of land use compatibility, um, the proposed, proposed provincial policies are, are less arbitrary and more performance driven based on a determination of adverse effect and the degree to which the effects can be mitigated with, within strategic growth and mixed use areas. So while they have narrowed the focus within employment areas uh, to uh, a more narrow band of uses, um, there has been a bit of a relaxing of this outside of these employment areas as is proposed in the, in the draft planning statement. In particular, so this policy, industrial manufacturing and small scale warehousing uses that could be located adjacent to sensitive land uses without adverse infact, effects are encouraged in strategic growth areas and other mixed use areas where frequent transit service is available outside of employment areas. So the policy test there is determining adverse effect. So they're permitted provided there's no adverse effect and provided they are small scale. So the translation there in terms of a development application would obviously be whatever study is appropriate, perhaps a land use compatibility study to try and determine what are the effects or impacts of the proposed uh, employment use. Um, and are they adverse? Can they be minimized? Can they be mitigated? In terms of managing the small scale aspect of the warehouse uses, this is where those gross floor area caps comes in. So you could have, you could still permit a warehouse and distribution use within a, a given zone in, in a in a growth area or mixed use area, mixed use area, but put a GFA cap on it to keep it to scale, keep it small, keep it appropriate to that area. Next slide, please. 
Uh, so locating sensitive land uses in proximity of employment areas, the proposed provincial uh, policies delete the requirement to demonstrate need uh, or to assess uh, alternate locations and they refocus with a mer mo sorry, more narrow focus on mitigating impacts um, as we've talked consistently throughout the presentation. Um, many of the recommendations in the report relate to land use compatibility and mitigation of impacts. These recommendations all remain consistent with the proposed provincial planning statement. Uh, and finally, the recommendation to strengthen land use compatibility policies within the official plan to provide policy metrics for the avoidance of encroachment between employment lands and other sensitive land uses is also consistent with the, the new provincial direction. Next slide, please. So with that, um, for any of the, the members of the public who are in council chambers or watching from home, uh, the report that I've referenced in this presentation is available on the council agenda for tonight. And if there are any comments, uh, please do forward them to Mr. Brad Sunderland uh, in the planning department and his email address is there. And with that, uh, we'll go to the final slide and have some discussion. Oh, sorry, there's staff recommendations. Uh, Brad, did you want to come in and finish that up? Uh, sure, thank you, Allison. Um, so the staff recommendations tonight on the report are that um, we move forward with amending the zoning bylaw with the new definition proposed as outlined in the report, and that the report be used to inform the ongoing OP review and the future comprehensive zoning bylaw review. Thank you very much, Mr. Sunderland. Uh, Council, I see a number of hands. Councillor Giddings, Councillor O'Meara, Councillor Elgar. Councillor Giddings, you're up first. And Councillor Longo. Councillor Giddings, you're first. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I have a whole new understanding and appreciation of the complexities uh, that are contained in it. Uh, you mentioned that uh, in the... on. Uh, page three of your index, that the existing policy framework is consistent. You detailed that to us. And then you mentioned that various elements of the Oakville framework could be strengthened. Is that where you spoke to uh, avoidance and mitigation measures as the primary uh, solution there? Yes, um, through you, Mr. Mayor, and also to the rest of council. Um, that is where you can have policy direction in terms of instances where buffering may be required or where certain studies could be required. You could say within a certain distance, uh, a land use compati compatibility study uh, may need to be submitted. Um, that's where you start and lay the groundwork for some of those policy tests in terms of determining what is adverse effect and how could it be mitigated or minimized. Thank you. Um, the scale of warehousing and distribution uses could more effectively be regulated through the application of, of GFA. So help me understand what uh, would be better. Is it the size of the warehouse or is it the use, whether it's a warehouse, a, a last mile delivery station, because they each have their own uh, difficulties that they can introduce to an area depending on where it's located. Is it strictly size or uh, I know earlier on it talks about they don't neatly fit. And so any help you can provide us on that one? Yes, certainly. So much of that is scale related. Um, in terms of what that use does and how it functions, you have trucks and goods coming in. They stay within that facility for a period of time, short period, a little bit longer, dependent. And then they are again shipped out. So you've got, you know, you've got an in, you've got a, a staging time and an out. And the scale of that use will begin to dictate how many loading bays, how many trucks, frequency of trucks, um, how many employees. So it's not really in how the use is defined, it, a lot of that is actually tied to the scale, which is what the, the gross floor area would regulate. Which leads to the 
additional regulatory mechanisms that you talk about later on in the report. Um, did you see any municipalities that have tried to combine them or separate them out? Uh, you mentioned the difficulty in doing so in trying to regulate both of them. Uh, any municipalities that you're aware of looking at that? Um, no, it, there have been no municipalities, none of the case studies separated them out as two distinct and separate uses. Um, they, I believe it was the town of Ajax in their definition, they actually had warehouse slash distribution facility, but in all of the other case studies, they simply recognized them as warehouse, warehousing uses. All right. Um, anything on the horizon that could be viewed as another disruptor? We've, you know, we've gone through to the uh, one day delivery and, and uh, last mile juice. Other than drones, I suppose, is there anything else that you see coming at us in a hurry? No, no, I would have nothing to add there. <laughs> Great. All right. Uh, thank you very much. And Mr. Mayor, at the appropriate time, I will have a motion. It's always in order to introduce a motion. All right. I'd like to, if we could, if we could hold off until we hear from our council colleagues. All right. Your council colleagues might like to know where you'd like to go, but Councillor O'Meara, Councillor Giddings wants to keep his uh, ideas to himself for now. Councillor O'Meara. Uh, thank you, Worship. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I'm wondering if you wouldn't mind just circulating that presentation uh, to councillors. I always find it's hard to read and listen at the same time, and there was a lot of reading going on in that presentation, so I'd appreciate that if, if you could. Um, I believe it was slide 24, and I'm hoping you can just clarify. I, I think it said that you would recommend not including retail or outlet or wholesale in the warehousing distribution uh, area, but then on slide 22, it said what the province is advocating is to permit associated retail and commercial. Um, and, and from what I have garnered from many of the businesses in my ward, uh, the Muskoka Chair Company, uh, for one, which we're all proud to have uh, uh, here in Oakville, they need more retail area as they find efficiencies in the warehousing and the distribution area, but they're looking for more than we permit right now. So I'm wondering if you could bring some clarification to the whole retail in a warehouse distribution uh, uh, discussion, because m my residents who own it and ship it out to places say they need more, but what I'm, I think I'm hearing something different from you. Yes, so um, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor O'Meara. Um, what the province is, is really establishing in their policies at that point is those employment areas that slowly start to essentially erode away from that primary employment function. So suddenly you start having a Kelsey's and then you sort of have a Walmart ends up in there and, and bit by bit the primary employment function erodes. So to the degree that there would be retail supportive of that primary employment function, uh, the province is envisioning that that would be permitted. Um, but to the degree that you start to have these more standalone type uses that begin to mix in and then slowly that core function of the employment area disappears, that is what they're they're trying to address through that. Okay, and, and that's that's what I had always interpreted and I, and I appreciate that. I, I just don't think that came across very clear on that slide 24. So as long as our staff are reflective of, of that, I think we're on the same page here. You don't want it to eat around the edges, but the warehousing people who need that retail element to support what they're doing, I think is, is the important factor that I've heard. So thank you, thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, Councillor O'Meara. Councillor Elgar. Thank you, through Mayor Burton. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, one thing I noticed you didn't mention uh, that has had a major impact is Bill 215, Schedule 3, Main Street Recovery Act, where people have lived within a proximity of a warehouse, which would never was a problem, except with Bill 215, uh, the, the Main Street Recovery Act, they're working now, start at night, and, and they're backing up and back up beepers and docks pounding and everything all night nothing a municipality can do about it. Uh, the people have talked to provincial people, they're not doing anything. Okay, so here, how, how are we gonna sort, sort this out? Because you've got people, no problems for 20, 30 years. Houses have been there 30, 40 years. Warehouse has been there a long time, but that act came in and 
we have no controls. Town staff, we've I've gone to them. They're saying, we can't do anything. How do we solve this problem? You know, you're talking about compatibility. This is something that was compatible, which isn't compatible. Um, through your Mr. Mayor to Councillor Elgar, um, that definitely is um, an existing situation. Uh, so in 2021, as you know, the province amended the Municipal Act uh, and the municipality can now no longer rely on a noise bylaw to regulate uh, noise as a result of deliveries to a, a range of commercial uses, but even specifically they said noise related to uh, deliveries and, and distribution facilities. Um, so with that removed from the Municipal Act, um, that does remain an ongoing challenge for municipalities uh, to seek an alternate means of, of regulating that. This is a huge issue though. Like, mm -hmm. and this is like, these people have been there, the warehouse has been there, but with what they did, they took the powers away from the municipality and there's nothing saying we can be more restrictive, correct? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, this is not good. I thank you. Thank you, Councillor Elgar, Councillor Longo. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, actually, Allison, great presentation and, and great report. Um, Councillor Elgar actually talked about what I was gonna talk about, which was the noise. So with that, with the Municipal Act being amend amended, we now don't have any control as municipalities. So the coupling, decoupling, backup, and uh, you know, of trucks and things like that. So uh, I have nothing further to add, but that was, I just want that to be raised because the noise bylaw is under review, but if the provincial powers don't allow us to do anything, then our hands are tied. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Longo. Um, uh, Ms. Leoma, both of these uh, um, remarks um, remind me that you said there were other tools besides the noise bylaw, uh, uh, you know, separation distances, GFA, and so on. Do you want to reiterate that noise isn't our only tool? Yes, actually that, Mayor Burton, that, that is a, a point well brought forward. Um, there are other mechanisms in terms of distance and, and what I was looking at through the case studies and some of the, the subsequent reading to that, um, distance is the best factor in terms of creating that envelope of space between the employment use and other sensitive land uses. So when I say separation distances, I don't necessarily mean that all of a sudden there's a regulation pops up that says something has to set, be set back X number of meters from something else. In some cases that's appropriate on a site by site basis. But in other cases, as I said, it's about a zoning gradient. So it's how you mix the land uses. So for example, having intervening commercial uses that essentially put something in between those sensitive land uses and the employment use. Um, so definitely, uh, yes, that, that is another alternative um, to address that. Thank you for uh, helping with that. Uh, Councillor Nanda. Thank you, Mayor Burton, through you. Um, thank you so much, Allison, for the report and giving us a little bit more insight. It was uh, very helpful. Uh, my question is around, um, well, in our area, we've had some issues with residential abutting employment lands. And now I think we have an additional concern now that this Bill 97 has come in, what the definition of what that is going to be and how it's going to look. And in the report, it talks about um, the implications and for the existing and planned warehousing and looking at that through a future study. And you had also stated that um, looking and identifying employment areas within near proximity and the mapping exercise. Um, so Mayor Burton, when it's an appropriate time, would I be able to ask for uh, staff for additional information or an additional report on this mapping exercise? Uh, Councillor Nanda, why don't you ask them a question first and see what you get? Okay, so so my question would be how, how would we be able to find out what the implications are gonna be for the existing, um, existing warehousing and lands that we currently have? So throw you, uh, Mayor Burton, uh, to Councillor uh, Nav. Is, is that a question for staff or a question to me? Staff, or it was a question for staff and they are considering okay. their answer. If you have a contribution, it would be in order now, I think. <laughs> 
I don't have more than what I offered in the presentation. All right. I'll just remind everybody that uh, your, your report recommends the mapping exercise that the councillor is asking about. Uh, we'll turn to the planning director, Mr. Gabe Charles. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and, and through to, to council. One of the things that we need to go through once Bill 97 uh, receives royal assent is to understand what the, the implications are to how they classify area of employment. And then by extension of that, what does that mean uh, for warehousing? So it is going to take a rather extensive exercise for staff to start working through all, our, all of our employment land use designations to really understand how we now have to apply that PPS definition to, to the local context. So it's going to take us some time to go through and really define what's in and what's out of that area of employment. And by extension of that, how does that change our, our land use schedules? Once that gets completed, we then need to look at uh, the zoning bylaw, which is going to have to now implement those, those changes to, to the land use designation. So it's going to take us a little bit of time once we, we see uh, what Bill 97 or how Bill 97 lands. So Mr. Charles, do I understand you correctly to be saying that uh, when the province has finalized the framework we operate under would be the time to begin the, the other work recommended in this study? That's correct, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hazlitt Thiel. Thank you, Mayor Burton. Um, thank you for your report and, um, and for some of the learnings that have come out that will eventually be able to be uh, hopefully implemented. Um, I do have a few follow-ups. I understand that the scope of your, um, your work uh, focused on the GTA, but if uh, given that there's other jurisdictions that have had experiences with e-commerce, uh, delivery stations, uh, fulfillment centers, et cetera, for a longer period of time, and there's some evolution in their um, regulatory uh, approach. Um, would you be in a position to be able to provide us with some perspective on those other jurisdictions? Um, Mr. Yu, Mayor Burton, to Councillor Huslet Thiel. Um, Yes, uh, we would be happy to undertake that work. Uh, that is something that I could work with staff to come up with a, a terms of reference for that um, and look at some of those other, other examples that are perhaps a little bit further out of jurisdiction that provide examples of you know, something down in the States, for example. Okay, thank you for that. Um, in, in any of your work, did you uh, cross uh, a definition of what, what is small-scale warehousing? Uh, no, uh, small scale warehousing is not defined by the province um, and that did not come up obviously in any of the case studies or any of the, the supplemental literature that, that I looked at. Um, in terms of zoning for uh, the definity that you need through zoning, uh, gross floor area and caps, either maximums or minimums is really the best way to control scale in terms of what's considered small scale versus large scale. So I, I note that as your recommendation, I think it's one that needs to be explored further. Um, you, in your report, you talk about there is a distinction though, they are different, even though it is not, uh, there isn't a distinction in terms of use. And um, I'm wondering in the definition that you've put forward, you actually have left transportation terminal in that definition. Um, and yet one of the things we've struggled with is a delivery station. And, and I understand they are to some degree different, and yet to the public and to even to an applicant to, or a proponent, uh, there's a lot of trucks coming in or minivans coming in. Um, did you see anything where somebody wrote into the definition delivery station or last mile? Uh, no, that, that was a nuance that, uh, or a level of detail that did not come up in any of the case studies or, or the supplemental information. Um, a transportation terminal would be excluded uh, from the definition of warehousing, so that would not be included. Um, but no, that was, that was not a level of detail that, that I found in the research that we did. Were you able to um, note how long ago any of those case studies had changed their zoning bylaw or their OP? Like how long, um, is, what's the standing time that these, these bylaws have been there? So I don't have that off the top of my head, but it is in the report. So if you look in, there's a, a series of tables 
and it will uh, identify the consolidation date of those zoning bylaws. Uh, but we did actually try to also uh, choose case studies that were recent, so that nothing that was outdated. Okay, thanks very much for that. Um, so I, you, you referenced earlier about avoidance first, and I think that um, some of your recommendations could help us down the road in terms of that avoidance first. Um, but I'm uh, one of the struggles that we've had uh, in a, a warehouse uh, applications that we're working through a, uh, a land use compatibility, et cetera, is that uh, our employment um, uh, zones, if you will, uh, don't line up with our the D6 guidelines. So there's, you know, as you ha said, there's almost a hybrid, right? Class one or class two, mm -hmm. and yet um, I'd lean to say that the scale of these warehouses um, uh, are more class two. Uh, have you seen any examples um, in the case studies you did where they their employment, their regulatory matters line up with the D6 guidelines more closely? No, and in the application of those D6 guidelines, um, a lot of what's there is recommended. It's, it's guidance, it's a guideline, so it's not an absolute. Uh, so, for an existing facility, the D6 guidelines wouldn't capture that in any case. But where you had a development application coming forward, when that circulated, MOE would comment on that. And then it would be at the municipal level, those agency comments are implemented into whatever zoning bylaw amendment or whatever regulatory mechanism is coming forward, whether it, you know, how that translates down. Um, but in terms of lining the zoning up to the D6 guidelines. The D6 guidelines themselves are um, reasonably dated. They've been around for a long time, so not terribly surprising that they don't reflect a lot of the, the current hybrid type land uses that we now have. Uh, they just weren't in existence at the time the D6 guidelines were initially drafted. Um, so thank you for that comment. Though interestingly, they, they put separation distance and influence areas at a much higher number than the case studies that you came back with, which would help the the landowner and help uh, the residents um, not have so much friction about um, how they uh, they work together in compatibility. Um, I'll leave my questions there. My only question for staff is: I saw that uh, the public could uh, send in comments to to the planning department. Um, I know that some of the residents' associations didn't get an opportunity um, because this was it wasn't circulated to them, but it was obviously circulated to us. So they could still make a written submission um, to you. Uh, and now they've had the advantage of hearing this presentation um, or be able to review the recording. So that would be taken into consideration down the road. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I think it's, uh, oh, Councillor Adams is next. Thanks very much. I just had one question, uh, but just, uh, page 206 of our agenda has the uh, dates of the consolidated bylaws with the definitions of the warehousing from the different uh, municipalities that were looked at. I just had one question about the storage and um, placement of vehicles that might be related to warehousing or distribution centers. In any of your review, did you look at or did you see anything that would relate to uh, off-site storage or parking of uh, trucks or trailers? No, nothing to that effect. Okay, thanks. All right, anybody else? Councillor Giddings, are you ready to do the reveal? I am, and I altered it a, a little bit, so thank you for, uh, thank you for waiting. Uh, I'd like to move that we refer the report back to staff to seek additional research from other jurisdictions, identify options for designing for definitions that recognize the differences between warehouses and distribution centers in terms of scale, operational impacts, and best practices in land use compatibility requirements. Uh, this will allow staff to identify implications from the 2023 provincial planning statement and additionally, will provide residents a greater opportunity to review and comment to planning and this council. In speaking with staff, I understand that 
uh, Q1 2024 would work for them. It's feasible and will not delay or impact the associated work plan. Thank you, Councillor Giddings. Um, any speakers? Any objection to the motion? Councillor Adams. Can that be circulated? I'm just trying to... I, I heard what you said, but I wondered if I can read it. Councillor Giddings, would you circulated? like to read it again for Or can him? it be put up online so we can see it? Councillor Giddings. You give me a moment and I will pull it up and email it over. How's that? If you can provide it to the clerk, the clerk can put it on the overhead for the councillor. All right. Almost. Yeah. But we can't zoom in. Perhaps you could pass it to Councillor Adams. <laughs> Do you have it in an email, Councillor? I've been learning a few emails for this. Councillor Adams, uh, if there's anybody else over there who wants to see it, would you pass it around when you're done? We'll use the old technology. Councillor Lischina, while, while that goes on, would you like the floor? Thank you, Worship. Uh, I'm, the one thing I'd, I'd like to keep in mind and, and as we move forward with this is to make sure that there's costs associated with all these studies because I'm curious at the end how much all of this is going to cost us. Thank you. We'll direct that to the commissioner and see what we get. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, that would be additional scope required, and so there will be additional budget. And I, uh, I am hesitant to put a number on that uh, at this point in time. If if there's accommodation within our existing budget, then we'll move forward. If not, we'll have to make a budget request for that amount. Councillor Hazlitt-Thiel. Thank you, Mayor Burton, and thank you, uh, Councillor Lischina, for the, the, the comment. Um, I, I think I would like to put some context around why it's so important that we do it and we do it right, because we have spent, as of June 22nd, almost a full year trying to figure out how we're going to help two warehouses be successful um, in uh, their establishment in Oakville, and what is the right uh, land use compatibility studies, what is the right full utilization studies. Um, and we also went through the experience of individual, uh, 
applications where there was significant differences in terms of the transportation on the road network and the impact it had on uh, not just the road area, but the abutting residential lands. And so as councillors that have had to deal with um, the, the frustrations on both sides, both the, the, the property owner and the resident, um, I think it's incumbent upon us to get the absolute best practice. And had I seen the scope of, uh, of work before it uh, went out, um, I would have asked that we can consider uh, some of the jurisdictions in the United States because um, I have a group of residents that have spent more than a thousand hours trying to get their hands or heads around uh, what we're doing and how we're doing it. And all I'm asking is that we have the, the best practices because frankly, we're not gonna get all this work done in the next two to four years anyhow. So I'd like to make sure that we have the exact, um, the best information we possibly can. Um, and, uh, and in the future, uh, others will not have to go through what maybe we have. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Lischina. Can you hear me? Oh, thank you, uh, Councillor Hazlitt Field. But with respect, we, we have a report in front of us that is comprehensive. You just don't like what it says. And I will be blunt with that. You're correct. I don't like what it says. All right, uh, Councillor Elgar. Have a recorded vote at the appropriate time, please. <laughs> sure. Um, has that circulated? Has everybody now seen it? Um, can I put the vote? Are there any more comments? Councillor Noel. Can we just actually ask count a staff to, uh, we heard from Councillor Hazlitt-Field that, or I can't remember who is, which one, Councillor has with one of the Ward three councillors that it wouldn't matter to the timing. Can we actually hear the point of view of staff on this uh, on this amendment? Anything you like, Councillor. Thank you, Mr. Planning Director. You look eager to answer. I guess the two things, just as he's as he's preparing. One is, is this going to impact timing? And two, is there is there truly more research that can be obtained to further inform this report and this uh, bylaw amendment? Through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, we'll certainly get in contact with uh, the consultant team to, to see what the, the scope is going to look like. If we're looking at uh, best practices and doing some further research, uh, I think we can get that done uh, for early next year. If it turns into more than that, uh, I can't promise when we'll be returning with information. I guess the question is, does anything, will there be any impacts on our project? Will this slow anything else down? Is this gonna be a problem? to our greater uh, work, work agenda here? Through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, loaded question, sir. Uh, there there are, are uh, a, a few high profile items that we're working through uh, right now. Uh, the good thing is that we've got a great consultant team uh, who can assist, so we may be able to offload a good chunk of this uh, to their team while we focus on uh, some of the other items. I don't see it uh, prolonging things too long if, uh, if that's the case. I'm going to declare that it's time to vote, and I'm going to ask if there's any objection to the motion. All right, Madam Clerk, would you record Councillor Grant, Councillor Noll, and Councillor Lischina as opposed, and the rest of us in favor? Or would Councillor Elgar like a, a full-blown roll call vote? Where did he go? Oh, oh I, he I'm fine with that, Mayor Burton. That's fine. All right. Then we're done, and we're moving on. 7.2, draft plan of subdivision, part of lot 30, concession two, Brawny Green Corporation. We have a presentation from Paul Barrett, our acting manager of current planning, and we have a registered delegation on behalf of the applicant for questions, if any. Uh, Mr. Barrett, uh, we are ready for your presentation. Thank you, your worship and members of council. A draft plan of subdivision application was submitted by Brawny Green Corporation. This presentation will summarize the staff report, which can be found as item 7.2 on tonight's agenda. The subject property is located at the northwest corner of Charles Cornwall Avenue and Queen Plate Road and contains a stormwater management facility 
which is planned to be relocated. Livable Oakville designates the subject lands as low density residential for the lands fronting onto Queens Plate Road and medium density residential for the lands fronting onto Merton Road. Likewise, the zoning permits single detached dwellings on the portion of lands fronting Queen Plate Road and townhouses fronting Merton Road, subject to a holding provision uh, regarding noise mitigation. This was implemented as part of an Ontario Municipal Board decision for the larger area. The purpose and effect of this application is to create six lots for detached dwellings, that's on the top of the screen, and one block for six townhouse dwelling units, that's on the bottom of the screen, together with two reserved blocks to be merged with the abutting subdivision. The proposed draft plan of subdivision constitutes a planned extension of the surrounding neighborhood and implements the land use designation and zoning as approved by the Ontario Municipal Board. Many of the standard subdivision obligations have already been secured as part of the adjacent subdivision, such as extension of the public road network, street trees, and utilities. However, I wanna draw your attention to three key issues and explain how they have been resolved. The first one is stormwater. The entirety of the subject property is occupied by a stormwater pond, and that's outlined in green on the, the image in front of you. This pond serves regional lands to the south. The function of this pond needs to be replaced off-site before the existing stormwater pond can be decommissioned and homes built. The conditions of approval in Appendix A require this to be complete prior to registration, or in other words, before the proposed lots are created and building permits can be issued. To that end, the applicant is working with Halton Region to start construction of the replacement underground stormwater tank imminently. Number two, the roads. The proposed lots need to be accessed by roads. While town ownership of both Charles Cornwall and Merton Road extensions have already been secured, and that's highlighted in teal, uh, the color teal in the image in front of you, construction of the extensions cannot start until the existing stormwater pond is decommissioned. This has been secured for as part of the adjacent plan of subdivision, and the applicant is planning to complete both roads this summer. And finally, number three, noise mitigation. And as you may recall, this was raised uh, by council at the statutory public meeting in December of last year. The subject lots are located in proximity to stationary noise sources located in Halt and Regions lands which exceed ministry environment sound level limits. In accordance with the holding provision, no building permits will be issued until noise mitigation measures are designed, located, and installed. In addition, and as outlined in the staff report, noise clauses will be added on title of every lot uh, as part of this plan of subdivision, um, as outlined in the staff report regarding noise mitigation. Staff recommend approval of this draft plan of subdivision, subject to the draft plan of conditions outlined in Appendix A, as the requirements listed on this slide uh, and explained in the staff report have been fully satisfied. In conclusion, Your Worship, staff put forth the following recommendation as shown for Council's consideration. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Barrett. Uh, Councillor Elgar is first out of the gate. Thank you to your Mayor Burton, to uh, Mr. Brent. First, I'd like to thank him for a very detailed, wonderful presentation and report. Um, my, my concern is going forward, is there anything we can do so that when you go to purchase a house, that, that at least when the, at, at certain sections might jump out, one of them being they realize that that's where they do the police siren checks and the ambulance siren checks there. And I'm sure they'll meet the ministry guidelines, but I want to just make sure people are fully aware that uh, even they might meet ministry guidelines, but the, the, there's no, no time of day when they can't be working on vehicles, and that's going to be a problem. And number two is we are going to end up with 1,600, 1,609 units there when it's fully built out, probably. And right now, people's moving in there still believe there will be a Halton Region public school. 
but the majority of council in back in the day voted to actually uh, as of right that if it's not if the Halton Region District School Board do not purchase the land by spring of 2027 that in fact they have have an as of right to build 50 I think it's 50 houses on that property and staff can correct me if I'm wrong whether it's 40 or 50 but is there some way we can highlight that more? Because now the people are moving in, they're finding that out and they're very upset. And the school, Halton Region District School Board have got, have got their 10 year forecast. They do not have any plans in the next 10 years to have money to purchase that property. And other than that, it's an as of right. So that will always be a bus to school for anyone. And that's my biggest concern that those little, those little sections that I know are in the purchase of agreement they're missing that when they're buying their house. And I feel bad for them. That's after the fact. And then Councillor Longo and I have to deal with it when they keep calling. So is there anything staff can do to make a bold at those two sections? At least the, the one section for the, for the sirens, it, just in this pocket, but for the school also, for people moving in. The 16, when you have 1,600 units, you know, you're going to have 3,000 people. And they're not, I think that going forward, they're not going to be very happy. Through you, Your Worship, uh, regarding noise mitigation, um, you're right, Councillor. There is um, what the acoustic engineers refer to as high impulse sound uh, emanating from the Halton region lands. That was a serious consideration as part of the OMB proceedings, and it was addressed through uh, the holding provision on title, um, where the noise mitigation is professionally designed uh, and installed prior to any buildings being built in that area. So prior to anybody moving in, the noise will be mitigated to ministry levels. Um, secondly, as I outlined in the uh, uh, subdivision agreement, which is registered on title, there would be the noise warning clauses. I think a third thing we could do is also include that in the neighborhood information map. So that's posted in the sales center, uh, front and center when uh, potential purchases are making decisions in terms of purchasing homes. Um, that's uh, currently a draft plan condition uh, in Appendix A uh, of the staff report. Um, secondly, with respect to the school, um, you're correct. There is a, a clause in the draft plan of subdivision subsequent agreement uh, regarding um, the school block reverting back to residential uh, should it not be purchased by the school within seven years from date of registration. And I have that at March 12th, 2027. Um, so what we can do um, to mitigate that concern is also included in the neighborhood information map that it's not uh, certainly a school site, it's a planned school site um, and outlined the language in the draft plan of subdivision. Mr. Barrett, I thank you for that. I'll, I would move the staff, the staff recommendation there's nothing we can do but uh, this is just a, it's a, I just want to give everybody a heads up of what they're going to face going forward I thank you thank you Councillor Elgar Councillor Romero you're next uh, thank you your worship and and I'm not sure I don't think this is a maybe not a question for staff but I think the applicants on the line is there anything in the future when that commercial portion is going to be developed so that the people living there don't have to drive kilometers and kilometers away to get a bag of milk or have the kids get a chocolate bar? Is there anything on the horizon when they're going to be moving on that commercial portion? Through you, Your Worship, I can speak to the zoning of the site and what's permitted, but not the timing. Uh, the intent through the Ontario Municipal Board decision was for that block. There is a block set aside along Brawny Road uh, for it to be neighborhood commercial, so to serve the exact need that you're describing. So then, yeah, I don't know your worship if the applicant, I think you said they were gonna, they were here to delegate and if they, if they might care to answer if that's in the plans or if, if they're going to wait 10 years, I'm not sure, but I'll, I'll leave that to your discretion. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm having trouble hearing you. Uh, I, I'm relying on you to use your microphone and. Sorry, I thought I was. It's, 
it's kind of hard with all this stuff to get over to the to the microphone. So um, my question was when the applicant plans to fulfill the commitment on the commercial site at this property so that as we approve the residences here, the residents have some place to go to get a bag of milk or some sort of commercial use. We, we, we seem to just keep kicking that one down there. And I'm wondering if the applicant, who I believe was going to delegate or was on the delegation list, might be able to speak to that. Thank you, Councillor O'Meara. Um, uh, is Catherine McEwen available, I presume, online? Just let, let her come online. Apparently, she is joining us as quickly as she can, Councillor, to uh, field your question. Ms. McEwen, welcome. Did, were you able to hear the councillor's question? I did, and good evening through you, Your Worship. Um, I, Kevin Singh from Argo Developments is also on the line. As um, the commercial block is a standalone block, so it's not part of this application, but it it is intended to be delivered. I don't have um, timing, but perhaps Kevin Singh could loop in. I feel like he is also available, but. Absolutely, it is intended that that will be delivered as a commercial block. Um, it was a standalone block, so it did not need to be part of this draft plan application. Councillor O'Meara, does that satisfy you? Uh, well, not really, Your Worship, but, but that's okay. I mean, I know it's all one block and it's all the same development. Perhaps I could just maybe ask through the clerk or through our planner if Mr. Singh might be able to follow up and just uh, send us communications through staff about when the plan is for that. I, I think everybody who's there already and the people we're talking about tonight who are going to be there um, should know what to expect and when to expect by the same owner on the block next to it. Thank you. Hi there. Thank uh, you. My Thank you very here. much, uh, Councillor O'Meara. I have a new voice in the air. Is that Mr. Singh? Uh, this is he. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, through you to Councillor O'Meara, uh, I can advise that, yes, uh, we indeed have uh, every intention of proceeding with the development of that commercial block. We're currently in the midst of uh, conducting an analysis to, to, to essentially figure out what would be the best use for the commercial block uh, with what the neighborhood's needs would be. So uh, that is currently underway. Thank you, sir, for the information. All right, Council, I think it's time to make a decision. Is there any objection to Councillor O'Meara, uh, to Councillor Elgar's motion? Madam Clerk, uh, there's no objection. Congratulations, Councillor Elgar. Your motion carries unanimously. Uh, all right, Council, we can turn now to 7.3, the Ontario Heritage Act Alternative Notice Policy. And uh, our planner, uh, Carolyn Van Slichtenhurst, is available for questions. And there's a presentation if required. Uh, we have no registered delegations. And I'm happy to poll the audience if, if there are any. And I see a question from Councillor Duddick. Carolyn, you may want to come down. No, actually, Your Worship, I don't have a question. I just wanted to thank staff uh, for the quick turnaround in response to um, a member of the media who uh, Councillor Chisholm and I have in our ward. And uh, they reached out uh, very promptly, answered the questions, and it's in hand. So I just wanted to thank them for that. Well, thank you very much, Councillor. Um, perhaps you'd like to move the item. I would love to move the item along with the uh, Heritage Minutes. And if I could just briefly speak to the um, Heritage Grant Program. I'm well, sure everybody's read it, but uh, this could, year alone, this is the 10th year of the program. Excuse we, me. Could, could we just do the agenda in order for now? So sure. uh, is there any objection to Councillor Duddick's motion for 7.3? No objection. Carried unanimously. Thank you, Councillor Duddick. The next is the 7.4 notice of intention to designate multiple properties. Uh, same deal. You have your report. Staff are ready for questions. Councillor Duddick, do you want to handle this one? I'll move it. Thank you very much. Is there any objection? There being none, you're on a roll, Councillor Duddick. That carries unanimously as well. And then we have the notice of intention to demolish 2108 Lakeshore Road East. And we have the same uh, situation, staff and presentation-wise, uh, to uh, 
I'm on a roll with you, Councillor Duddick. Uh, are you moving this one too? I'm willing. Thank I'm you. Willing. Any objection to this one? Congratulations, Councillor Duddick. That's three in a row. Uh, and now we come to the Heritage Grant Program. And I know this is near and dear to your heart, so, so <laughs> sing your song. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, as I started saying, it's the 10th year of this program, and every year it has progressed to be more and more utilized by members of the community who have heritage properties, and not just individuals, but as you've seen from the report, it's various churches and other organizations, commercial property owners as well, who access uh, the grant program. This year we had a whopping $2.1 million worth of projects that were applied for, 55 various projects. Unfortunately, we could only supply 45 of those. Several of the applicants uh, submitted duplicate uh, requests for various aspects of their fund, but I'm just sort of giving you a heads up. Don't be surprised if maybe during the budget process, there might be a tin cup circulated. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Duddick. And are you moving 7.6 as well? As Absolutely. warning us about the tin cup. Thank you very and much. I, ju <laughs> I did want to thank staff too. They put a huge amount of work into that report and do extensive background work so that everything is vetted beautifully. So thank you. All right. Uh, Council, is there any objection to Councillor Dodick's motion on 7.6? Madam Clerk, there's no objection. That carries unanimously. Councillor Dodick, that's four in a row. Let's go for number five with the Cultural Heritage Landscape Conservation Plan Policy Adjustment. Uh, again, we have staff available for questions, but the presentation is pretty simple. Councillor Dodick, are you up for this one? I'm up for that too. All right. Thank you very much. Is there any objection? There being none, Councillor Duddick, congratulations. That's five in a row. Now we turn to the, Oak, the Heritage Oakville Advisory Committee minutes. And uh, the recommendation is that the minutes from the meeting, uh, uh, that, that items 4.1 and 4.2, which are permissions, uh, uh, be approved and the remainder of the minutes be received. Councillor Duddick? I think I'll defer to my fellow colleague, Councillor Giddings, to get in there. You've been nominated, Councillor Giddings. We'll go one for one. All right. Any objection? There being none, congratulations, Councillor Giddings. Unanimous. Now we need somebody to move that we rise and report to Council. Councillor Longo, thank you. Any objection? There being none, that carries. And I rise and report the Committee of the Whole has met and made recommendations on consent items 4.1 and 4.2, public hearing items 6.1 and 6.2, discussion items 7.1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7, and advisory committee minutes 9.1, as noted by the clerk. A mover and seconder to adopt the report would be in order. Councillor She, thank you. Councillor Grant, thank you. Uh, any objection? There being none seen, that's carried. And uh, now, new business, emergency, congratulatory, or condolence. Uh, all right, we'll jump right along to consideration and reading of the bylaws. We need two of you for that. Councillor McNeese and Councillor Elger, thank you. Uh, any objection? Madam Clerk, there being no objection, the bylaws as listed are considered read and passed. And that ends the work of this meeting. It's been terrific working with you. Thank you for all the preparation you did, all the great questions, and uh, that's the end of the meeting. See you next time.